If we're all sitting in around talking about, oh, I need this manufacturer, like how are you approaching your marketing strategy or how are you approaching your first new hires? Where's the conversation that says, how are you approaching culture? Have you thought about this? What are you doing? What are you seeing? Welcome to the Startup CPG Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Freitag. Today is our seventh episode in the first hire series where we've so far covered making first hires in marketing, finance, operations, and retail and food service sales. And we've talked with one of our community brands, Sweet Nothings, about making their first few hires. Culture comes up in some of those conversations, but I wanted to dedicate an entire episode to culture. We're joined today by expert Jennifer Yipez Balandel, owner of Medita Consulting, and our former Startup CPG podcast host to guide us in this conversation. And I'm so excited to share Jennifer's wisdom with you and have her on the other side of the mic. When I was the first marketing and operations hire at a CPG startup brand, I had big dreams about building a culture different than those I had experienced in the corporate world. Over the next two years and growing to 30 employees, I wish I could have had someone like Jennifer guide that startup from the beginning. Within our community of emerging brands are tomorrow's next household brand names. Can you imagine if the Frito-Lays and Coca-Colas of the world had these conversations from day one? There's an incredible opportunity to make change through building not only mission-driven products, but also through mission-driven teams of humans behind those products. Listen in as Jennifer shares about how to define culture and key terms, why culture is important and how the conversations around workplace culture have shifted, biggest mistakes founders can make, the process of developing values and how an outside expert can help, how culture expands beyond your team members to your customers and external partners, and more. And stay tuned at the end for a mini interview with Startup CPG Shelfie Award winner, Tiny Sprouts. After recording this interview at the end of last year, I got to meet Tina and Kim in person at Expo West and try the Tiny Sprouts product, which was amazing. And they had their Shelfie Award proudly displayed at their booth. So it's so fun to get to share this interview with you today. Now let's hear from Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to the show today. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you, Jesse. I'm so glad to have you here. So Jennifer and I met a few years ago when she was the season two podcast host for Startup CPG. And we've kind of stayed in touch. I've followed her journey. And I was, as we've been working on our first hire series, I wanted to talk about culture and kind of bring our conversation all together since we've been talking about kind of different uh, functions in isolation. And so I wanted to talk a little more holistically, and I couldn't think of anyone better than Jennifer to come on the show and share her expertise with us. So I'm just so happy that you're here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jesse. It's just so great to be back a part of the Startup CPG community. I've been watching you all grow. You guys are doing a fantastic job, and I'm happy to lend any support. So I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, I would love if you could help us frame our conversation. I'm big on kind of defining terms and defining what we mean in a conversation. So I'd love if you could kind of help us define what we mean by when we say culture and we're talking about that in a startup environment, what does that all include and would love to hear more? Yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, I personally use the word culture, you know, capital C, um, but you oftentimes hear in larger organizations or, you know, in the trades, DE&I, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. You might see the B thrown in there. That stands for belonging. Um, You're also seeing JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. But for me, when I think about boiling it all down and thinking about culture. It's the workplace environment and it's how you're treating people, right? From a diversity perspective, who are you surrounding yourself with, right? Who's in your organization? Who are your partners? Are they different? Are they bringing different viewpoints or is it looking in the mirror and you're only seeing yourself reflected in only a singular viewpoint? If you're finding yourself surrounded by difference, that's wonderful. How are we making sure that we're being intentional and that we're creating safe spaces for these individuals to feel seen, heard, and valued? And and how are you actively acknowledging that not everybody is coming to your organization, um, you know, in an equitable playing field, right? For some people, it's a really easy, smooth walk up to the starting line. And for others, there's going to be barriers. So how are you as a leader in an organization acknowledging that and having systems and policies in place to make sure that you're creating an equitable workplace environment. 
That's really helpful. And can you share too kind of how you have fit into this work, like a little of your career journey at the end, we'll definitely share more about how to connect with you. But I'm curious, just kind of also help us frame like, what is your part in helping companies with with this kind of work, you know, and based on the definitions you just shared as well? Yeah, so I spent over a decade in corporate marketing, communications, public relations, always helping brands communicate um, outward or outward message. A lot of CPG companies, you know, think of the big of the big, the big, (laughs) helping them with their culture strategy, lowercase c, external, right? How are we targeting diverse communities to have them attracted to our brand? But I was always approach this work with an underlining thread of representation and inclusivity. And oftentimes, you know, I identify as a Latina. So oftentimes when I'm in these brand conversations, when I'm in these major CPG conversations or within marketing and advertising agencies, I was the only, right? And um, not feeling seen, heard and valued, not all of my identities were being met, right? I was also a caregiver in corporate. So how was I being met, um, you know, as a caregiver, as a mother, how are my needs being met? And did I feel safe to share my ideas? Um, oftentimes, it was met with a big no. Um, and then so I think a lot of people, including people in the startup CPG community, there's a tipping point where you're not really feeling seen, heard and valued. So you're choosing that entrepreneurial route right? You want to make the difference in the world and you know how to create it. So about four years ago, I exited corporate um, and took on full head this consulting of how am I helping other people? How am I helping brands build an intentional workplace environment and intentional products that serves and reflects today's marketplace? Great. That's, that's awesome. And I'm curious too, like, can you tell us a little bit about why why this work can be so valuable, especially so early in a company's journey? Because a lot of the definitions you shared, like it totally makes sense that those are important for from the beginning of a company. But I feel like something like culture and some of these conversations, they don't happen until they're, they can be reactive or a company gets really big. And then they're like, oh, do we have a culture problem? We lost some employees or wherever. And even as yeah. a smaller company, you're just kind of busy building You've, like you said, you've made the jump to entrepreneurship as a reaction to wanting to create your own workplace, but then you get busy just operating the business. So like, why is it important to be really intentional about this work from the beginning? And kind of what's the opportunity for a startup to really make a difference by thinking about this early on? Yeah, Jesse, I think it's super important to start thinking about it, right? It's never too early to start thinking about um, and strategizing about how you're going to treat people. It's just never too soon, right? And that's just a personal ethos of mine. But I think startups have such a unique opportunity to be intentional in how they're building their brand and their company. Uh, from the foundation, right? I think of it as a bucket, right? If you have a bucket, which is the foundation and you have holes on the bottom, every time that you go into pour into that bucket, whether it's from a resource perspective or a hiring spike, or, you know, it's, you're trying to target a new consumer and you're just pouring in and everything's pouring out from the bottom. It's because you don't have a strong foundation. You need to make sure that that base is strong. And, you know, the way to do that is put pen to paper, Right. When you start your business, you have a brand strategy, your operational strategy, you know, your brand value proposition, your competitive advantage, all the things that go into your pitch deck. Why are you not thinking about, okay, what is the culture that I'm trying to create? I'm a singular entrepreneur right now, but the goal is to grow, right? How am I going to grow intentionally? And how am I going to be surrounded by other people? who want to help this brand grow too and and, um, align to my values and align to my mission. You have to be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that makes sense. And, you know, would you say that there's been a shift in how people have historically viewed these conversations versus now. And, you know, a lot of what you're saying too, like I see our brands and startup CPG, you know, like they're all trying to make better for you food and beverage and beauty products. So they're trying to put a product in the world that's better. So I definitely think they're going to resonate with trying to build, you know, a company culture that's better. But I'm also curious how this has changed in in the, you know, recent past as people have ta- have talked about this conversation. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of different shifts, right? There's a couple of lanes that you can go in, starting with, you know, what's the why behind it? Because you're absolutely right. We're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs today. It's coming from more of a heart set value of realizing 
I'm not being reflected in today's market or product. Thus, I'm going to go create it because I know there's others like me. Um, they're typically leaving corporate environments again because they know that mundane, you know, historical systems in place that are just not working for their identity. So it's in their heart to put humans first and to create something new. And then we're also seeing this rise of the value-led segmentation, right? I think it's two out of three Americans are choosing a brand based on values. And they're looking to that leadership of the organization to say, hmm, are you walking the walk? So a lot of the new brands that we're seeing today, it's really coming from that intentional um, value-based perspective. And then and then you're right. It's historically we've seen these bigger brands having to retrospect, right? Again, they have those holes in the bottom of their bucket. So they're going out and hiring consultants to say, you know, Eek, come help me. We need to help come plug these holes or help me identify where the cracks in the holes are. So it's a very, they're doing it very reactively instead of proactively. Right. And then, you know what? Let's also talk about, um, you know, historical approaches to culture, right? And um, so let's start there. I, you know, because I think you were asking a little bit about how historically, how organization approach culture I think historically, a lot of companies see something like DEI or culture living solely in HR or people and operations function. You know, that's not working, right? If that was working, we would have, we would see inclusive places all over the map, but that's not the case. Really, when we're thinking about culture and building a foundation, a strong culture workplace environment and putting humans first, that really needs to live horizontally in your business strategy. It needs to be in every piece of business because it impacts every single lane of your business. Of course, it impacts you know your talent and who you're attracting to work in your company, how you're retaining that talent, but it's also you know how are we looking at the consumer mi- marketplace? right? The consumer marketplace today is vastly diverse with many social identities. How are we thinking differently as an organization? Do we have the right people in place to think about this? And then again, and then that leads into how are we designing and innovating new products, right? What new SKUs are we going after? How are we creating that? Again, it goes to diversity of thought and ensuring that you have an inclusive environment to people to hand raise to say, hey, I have an idea. So it really needs to live horizontally in every touch point of your business. Yeah, that's that's such an important point. And I think also that you know, just conversations around HR in general, it tends to be a topic that everybody's, you know, nobody really wants to talk about HR anyway. And so then putting this in that bucket makes it even come up, I feel like even less because also HR is like, oh, when we get to 50 employees, we'll have HR. But this isn't, like you said, we're we're taking this out of the HR bucket and we're, we're spreading it across the as a horizontal piece of the business. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, it's never too early to start thinking about it, even though if you don't have, you know, full-time employees, if you're just working with partners or freelancers, um, again, it, it goes to your brand values and how are you treating people and partners and freelancers and working with manufacturers, those are people at the end of the day. How are we taking that human first approach to every touch point that they're that making contact for our business? Yeah, I love that you brought up the, the, the partners that you work with, because I think especially like you said, some of the brands in our community, they may have no employees yet or one or two employees, but they're definitely working with different partners and how you treat partners external to your organization is is part of this conversation. And I'm I'm curious too, like, can you give us some some tips or thoughts for like getting started? Because I think it can also feel overwhelming of like, well, how do I do it right? Or like, you know, I don't, I don't want to do it wrong. So but it feels overwhelming to get it right. So I'm just gonna, you know, I'm not sure where to start. And then you end up not starting, you know, so like, I'm curious about your tips for like getting started, overcoming the hurdle of like, worrying that, you know, you're not going to quite get it right. Like, you know, what are your what are your tips? I think you start with acknowledging that you're not going to get it right, right? And I think that's the biggest mistake that you can make is not taking action at all. If you're coming from a place of fear in a place of I have to get it right, I have to get it perfect, you're going to fail. You have to understand that we're humans and nobody's perfect. So you have to start somewhere. So take that initial step. And that initial step can just be 
even visioning, right? You have a brand vision, you have a vision of longevity of what your company is and what it stands for and and what your end goal is. Why not have an end vision of the environment that you want to create? right? Create that mood board, create that vision statement to say, this is how I want people to feel and um, interact with each other within the constraints of a workplace of environment. Um, and there you can start developing a strategy, right? And it's hard. And, and, and not everybody, it comes naturally intuitive, but that's why there's people like me and others out there who can come in and help you set your intentions and help you build that strategic roadmap just like you would for operations or marketing. Marketing may not be your forte. So you're going to hire somebody to come help you set your intentions and have that strategic roadmap. Same thing with culture. Right. And it seems like from you mentioned earlier of, you know, having an environment where someone can, you know, kind of raise their hand and give feedback to you. And I think there, it also seems like a lot of pressure to like write down, you know, a roadmap of like, you know, this is what my culture is going to be. And you can have really great ideas, but it seems like a important part of that is building it in the uh, the flexibility of like, as I hire people and feedback mechanisms. So you may have an idea, but you may learn that that, you know, that ultimately that wasn't a great idea or that, you know, there was some sort of bias or something that you needed to work through. But if you have the right culture, you can, you're constantly learning, you're getting feedback from like employees. I'm curious about that, like how it can evolve over, over time and how to kind of set yourself up to, to be flexible. Yeah, Jesse, well, your intuition is spot on. The feedback mechanism is key because again, we're not going to get it right. So when we fail, how do we learn from that failure for that mistake, right? Failures are not failures, they're just learning opportunities. So how are we capturing that feedback in that continuous feedback loop from our partners, you know, from our employees, from our contractors, and say, how are we doing better from here? Where did we take a misstep? How do we learn from this? And how do we grow? And again, it's all about evolution of your culture, just like your product probably has, has had an evolution from it, the conception to where you are now, your culture is going to flux as well. And so can you tell us a little bit like, what what does it look like to work with someone like yourself or say a brand that's got a few employees, you know, a couple couple co-founders and, you know, they're working with some external partners. Can you share a little bit like what the process is to work with an outside expert through some of these conversations? Yeah. And it's going to vary, right? Take a very bespoke approach with everybody that I personally work with. Um, but it first starts with setting your intention and and assessing, assessing where you are today. What are the tools and the resources? Where do you want to be? Again, what is that long-term vision? Um, And helping you set your vision, helping you set intentions, and then building a strategic roadmap on how you get there. You're you're not just going to magically appear to your end destination. You need a map to get there. Um, So it's important when you come in and you're assessing to say, okay, what is your vision ahead? But then also, where have you been, right? Tell me about some of the missteps or what have you not built before? What have you not thought about before? And that's where I come in to come help you um, assess everything and then build a plan together. And is there anything, if someone's looking for some external help and external perspective, like are there any red flags, green flags for for, um, people to look for and kind of vetting a partner to work with? Ooh, that's a good question. I take a very humanistic approach, obviously, when I'm working with people, because that's the world that I want to build. And that's the world that I want to help others build, right? Workplace environments that are holistic and safe. Um, so I, for me personally, it just kind of starts with this an intake process of tell me about yourself as a founder. Tell me about your brand values. Um, if there's synergy and alignment on, you know, making better for you choices for our consumers, Um, new products and ideas where there's been product gaps because people have historically created from a singular dominant culture lens. And so when you're trying to find a partner uh, to help you build your culture, I would suggest looking for the same thing, right? Is it, is this a person that's going to reflect and mirror exactly who I am and my beliefs, which is sometimes great, but is this person also going to be a window for me to show me a new way, to show me a new path and have that collective energy to make my brand better? Mm-hmm. And are there any other, it sounds like one of the, one of the common kind of, you know, pitfalls or, or, you know, common mistakes is not starting at all. Um, are there other kind of, you know, pitfalls or things to watch out for in navigating conversations around culture? Are there 
are there things that look like you're making progress, but you know, they're actually maybe just kind of performative and they're not really getting down deep in your business. Like, I'm curious if there's kind of traps that, you know, we can think about to avoid. Yeah. And I think it's, it's approaching culture from an integrity perspective. If you have, if you're creating something from a singular view and you're just doing marketing placements for Black History Month or, you know, Latinx History Month or Pride, um, you're going to be missing the mark. You're you're probably just talking the talk and not walking the walk and your consumers are going to smell that a mile away. And so are job seekers, right? And the data shows that almost 80% of talent and job seekers are looking for people walking the walk and they're digging in deep to say, okay, is this organization really one that... Um, you know, or has a value alignment. Um, so strong sense of discernment. So you really need to make sure that you're, you're showing up correct. And that's surrounding yourself by people who um, represent the identities that you're trying to reach um, and starting from there. And how often do is culture in and like the how your business shows up like, the, you know, that's happening. It's all around you every day. It's everything you do. Do you have tips for like how often to like be having intentional conversations and check ins like with employees, with yourself, with external partners? You know, is it is it coming up every week in meetings or? month. Like, I'm curious, you know, and as an ops person too, I'm like, how do you, I'm like, it's one thing to have your values on a wall or do, you know, but how do you really build it into like, this is just part of what we do that we're regularly reviewing this and making sure it's top of mind and make it like part of our DNA. Like, I'm curious if there's any kind of tactical recommendations you have for like building it in. Yeah, super tactical things that you can do, right? Taking again, what you just said, taking your values off the wall and putting it on paper, have it a watermark in every marketing brief, every internal meeting, if you finish uh, a product, or if you finish a design sprint, have a debrief on it and bring back up that the values and the culture of how did we how did we get through this collaboration sprint together, right? What came up for you? Start dissecting that and spend time and be okay with the messy middle, right? I, I feel like as a society, we just want to get to the to the shiny end and to the goal to say, aha, we did it. But no one wants to spend time in the messy middle and really unpacking what went wrong in order to fix it for the next design sprint. So those tactical things of like, talk about it at the top of every internal meeting that you're having. When was the last time that you send your partners a survey that says, hey, how are we doing? Right? How is it working with us? How can we better communicate with you? Tell me about a time when, right? Getting that continuous feedback loop are just some tactical ways that you can start thinking about your culture daily. Right. That's great. And for, you know, we've talked a lot about values as well. Do you have any tips for thinking through the values conversation of how to define your your values and you no know, like you said you're you know maybe condensing down to something that you can have you know that you see and come up regularly it's it's harder to make something like you know condensed and concise than to have a big long long list i feel like um so i'm curious like how do you how do you help people like condense like all right this is really the core values we come up with like is it exercises you go through or like how do you kind of distill something down to that core those core values yeah, and you can see how I keep saying that because that's my intersection of my old marketing and design and working within those environments with that intersection of culture. Um, so I'm glad that you picked up on that. It's hard to shake for me. I think when you're starting a brand, you you have to have that strong foundation, that brand narrative foundation. And along with that is what are your brand values? What do you stand for? What do you want your consumer to see in you reflected in them? If you don't have that, you're not going to have a strong burn, right? You're just making something quick and off the, off the shelf and it's a widget. But if you're really wanting longevity and to stay relevant, you have to have those strong brand values and those need to be embedded through your entire culture. So starting with you know, even just discovering who am I as a brand? Who are we as a company? What do we stand for? That's something that needs to happen at the starting point. And do you have any recommendations for founders as leaders, especially, you know, it's it's one thing to to be be a founder working with a co-founder, you know, maybe a couple employees, then as you grow, you know, suddenly you've got 10 employees, and you're really in a in a big leadership position. And that can be a big change. Do you have any tips for 
you know, either education that founders can do or regular self-reflection or working with an, you know, an outside expert on like, how do you, how do you make sure that you're growing and really able, setting yourself up to step into this leadership role that's going to kind of continue to have more demands and really, really make sure that you can, you know, do all, you can still achieve all the values that you said in the beginning. It's it's going to look different as you evolve. So I'm curious about any tips for for leaders and growing into leaders. I love that. If you are a self aware enough of a leader to say, I need help in this new position that I found myself in. Right, you go from a singular entrepreneur, solo entrepreneur, and growing and leading a team that takes coaching. Right, I would highly recommend you find a leadership coach. Um, a design working coach, you know, call me, I use one, I will be happy to refer you. Um, But I think that is a a signal and a sign of a true leader to say, to say, I have enough self awareness to know that I can't serve everybody to the best of my ability without a certain skill set. And that's another thing too, when it comes to culture. I think a lot of people think it's character based, right? If you're a good person or a bad person, it's just skills based, right? It boils down to culture skills. We, some of us have them innately and and we grew up with these skills and other people don't. And that's okay because these these skills are learnable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so glad that you brought that up. I remember seeing a a post that you had about that of um, that skills based and not character based. And I was like, oh, that's such a good reminder. Cause yeah, it's, I feel like when we talk about, when you talk about culture, it seems like, oh, like are the people here good people or is this person, you know, Mm -hmm. like we're kind of making like value judgments versus like, you know, do we do we have the ability to level up our skills to step into these roles? And so, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. You know, with one of my with one of my clients and partners, we always say internally, this is skills based and not character based. And it's just like, you know, upskilling your your employees with the latest Excel, right? You can learn Excel. You can't just use it once and then never use it and be like, I'm an Excel expert. No, you have to practice it and it's a skill, right? And so that's when it comes to culture and and cultural competency and cultural humility. It's all just, it's all about building your skills. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a couple of times, like a strategic roadmap. And is that is that something also where you're defining like, the, you know, these are the skills, you know, these are how we're going to be putting our skills, um, you know, to work and, and so that in making that shift from, you know, the mindset that maybe it's character based to, okay, this is actually about developing skills. Can that be part of that roadmap of like, this is what it looks like to, you know, to continue on this journey? Absolutely. Right. Because if you have your vision, again, you need the map on how to get there. Um, It's just, you know, to make it more tangible, just like a marketing strategy plan, you know, you need to hit X amount of cells or you need, you need to capture wide audience X base. How do you do that, right? You have a strategic plan. Well, we're going to do social. We're going to do out of home. You know, we're going to do paid. We're going to do earn. Same thing with culture. How are we going to get to our envision? Well, there's steps and and, um, line items in place that you need to do to make sure that you're going to get to that vision and hit your goals as a company. Right. And when with these conversations of like, as you add employees, is this something that, you know, you're bringing employees into the conversation of the planning or, you know, you mentioned some like we talked about, like having a feedback loop. So like as you grow, what does it look like to involve employees in the planning process and, and having them have a voice and a part of, you know, shaping the culture? I think you can communicate out to say, hey, you know, we want you to take an active part in in structuring our culture. But as a leader, at the end of the day, that's your responsibility. I think it's one thing to send out surveys to get get feedback. That's absolutely a must to make sure everybody's being heard. But as a leader, you know, the buck stops with you. So you Mm -hmm. at the ultimate at the end of the day, um, you are responsible for how that culture plays out and how it's shaped. And I think naturally, and you, you'll, you've you seen this, Jesse, I'm sure in the roles that you've had, there's going to be hand raisers. I was always that hand raiser inside corporate to say, hey, I have ideas and I feel very strongly about this. Let me help you shape um, how this culture should be, or I'm seeing something different than you might. Let's collaborate. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned too, as part of a review that like that someone like you can do is, is making sure that, that you're not missing like a key 
demographic or group of values of people. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process can look like to kind of make sure that you're you're not missing out on, you know, the diverse population that you can be marketing to, but you may kind of be just kind of laser focused on on one small part. Yeah, I absolutely love doing that. I obviously my background is marketing, branding and advertising. So I love nothing more than working, especially with a startup and coming in and auditing to say, who else, you know, who else am I leaving off the table? Who haven't I thought about? He took a look, take a look at this language. Where am I from a language perspective? Is my language being, um, you know, inclusive? Is it being harmful to some people? Somebody who's hand raising and saying, I want to make sure that I'm representing myself and my brand a certain way. I just, please come help me um, and audit this and help me set my intentions. That that fills my joy cup. I can do that all day long. Um, I've worked with different people in the past of saying, you know, hey, I come from, you know, a white background or dominant culture background, and I have a I- product idea. It's rooted in culture. I don't want to misstep. Can you come help me strategize on is this a viable opportunity? What else do I need to do to make sure that this is coming from a place of appreciation, not appropriation? I have that conversation with a lot of brands, um, and, and it's a it's it can be a tricky conversation. But those are always the ones that end up very fruitful, um, and those are the leaders that I enjoy working with because they have a, a level of self awareness to even ask those questions at the beginning. Um, so I'm always happy to help. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Any other tips on kind of the the first hire piece of, you know, navigating the the first few hires? So I think, you know, if you are looking for outside consulting help, someone to help you shape that culture and set your foundation, write down the top five or 10 things that you feel like you want to get right. If you're, if you know that as an organization, you're going to be growing immensely, what is the approach that I'm taking to hiring? How am I hiring? Where am I posting this information, right? Again, if I'm just going to my singular silo of a network, that network might just be reflective of my identities, right? Again, it's looking in a mirror. If I'm hiring, how am I also looking at evaluation of employees? That's something that a consultant can help you with as well. How am I evaluating in an equitable, inclusive way how people are contributing to our overall organization and our brand mission? And then obviously, with hiring comes, you know, letting people go. Again, how are we thinking through in a human first way? What does that look like when an employee decides to departure? or, you know, we're asking them to depart. So really having that through strategy, that's something that a consultant can help you with and and help you plan and design together. Yeah. Oh, that's super helpful. Any other kind of parting thoughts you want to leave us with on this topic? What's coming to mind, Jess, think maybe a good way, you know, to kind of wrap that conversation is that, um, you know, this community of, of, of founders and entrepreneurs, it's, it's such a blessing because we're all in the same place together and we need to start being transparent about what we know and what we don't know. If we're all sitting in around talking about, oh, I need this manufacturer, like how are you approaching uh, your marketing strategy or how are you approaching your first new hires? Where's the conversation that says, how are you approaching culture? Have you thought about this? What are you doing? What are you seeing? Do you know anybody that can help me? Once we start normalizing those conversations, we're going to be in a way better place to start building workplaces of the future and for today, right? Again, it's that humanistic approach. We just need to have um, intentional conversations about the cultures that we want to create. So let's start having those conversations. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I think that's a great way to like tie it all together. And, you know, tell us where we can find where we can find you if brands are interested in, you know, in talking with you or potentially working with you, where can they find you? And, and yeah, just a little bit more about what it looks like to work with you. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody can reach out to me. Just send me an email. I'm at jblundell at medithaconsulting.com. You can find me through LinkedIn. Um, just shoot me a message and, and let's chat. I would love to see how I can help you shape your company 
for today's marketplace. Awesome. And I'll include those links in the show notes too. So folks can go and uh, find those links to connect with Jennifer. Well, Jennifer, this has been so great to have you on the show. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and insights with us and, you know, helping us really, you know, kind of continue this first hire conversation on such an important topic. So, so just so glad you were here today and thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Don't go anywhere just yet. Stay tuned for a mini interview with Kim and Tina from Tiny Sprouts. Hi, Kim and Tina. Oh my gosh, it's so wonderful to have you here today. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing really well. So happy to have you both here. So happy to be here. Awesome. Well, I would love, can you tell us a little bit, first of all, about your products? Um, and then we'll kind of jump into the story behind them. For sure. So um, we are the founders of Tiny Sprouts Foods. Um, we make the first ever and only um, <laughs> organic super seed boosters for babies and big kids um, to help boost their nutrition from, you know, when they take their first bites at six months. So, you know, uh, our products are uh, blends of cold milled seeds and other superfoods like probiotics and vitamin D to help support um, healthy childhood development. That's so cool. And you were one of our Shelfie Award winners, which is amazing. And so, yeah, tell us a little bit about deciding to found Tiny Sprouts, like the story behind it. We'd love to hear more. Yeah, definitely. So just uh, just as an aside, getting that award was a highlight for us of this year because we have been working so hard, as all founders do, to source this, this company um, into something that has now been awarded Best New Kids product. So huge highlight for us. And we're so appreciative to start up CPG for that honor. So Tina and I actually were both moms. Uh, we both have two kids and we both came from a very corporate background. Um, so working for big corporations and always knew that we wanted to do something more, something different, something more meaningful and more purposeful. And um, this idea of Super Seed for Kids actually came to life on Mother's Day. How coincidental. Um, I was taking a shower and I have <laughs> always been into superfoods and, you know, all the best ideas come in the shower. <laughs> so um, I had run out of my daughter's chia seeds and thought, why are there no chia seeds for kids? Um, and, um, you know, Tina has always been very nutrition minded. Um, has always wanted to do something different for children as well, because it's a huge passion for us, children's nutrition, health and nutrition. So we talked on the phone and no joke, maybe about 48 hours later, um, Tiny Sprouts Foods came to life. Um, and that was back in um, in May of 2020. So we officially incorporated in August 2020 um, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, uh, where, you know, a lot of people did have more um, of their eye on better health, better nutrition, better immune um, immune health, um, digestive health, which also impacts immune health. So um, all of these different factors actually just came together at the right time to help develop and build our products and our company to where it is today. Yeah, that's amazing. So what did it look like to go from, okay, we're going to start this and then now you, you know, now it's got to end up in the cool packaging that you have. Like, what did that process look like to, to, you know, to get it into kind of the commercially available, the v product version? So as, as Kim mentioned, we come from, from very corporate backgrounds. Um, so we weren't the type to just like dive in without doing our, our due diligence. Um, so what we did really was, you know, we did a lot of research, um, and, you know, figured out if there was like a need for this product, um, you know, a lot of the, like we started looking at different ingredients and so on and so forth. So we did a lot of research and um, realized, you know, that this there there's something special here, right? We went on social media. We realized that there were a lot of questions when it came to super seeds for children. And once we had all of that, those learnings behind us, we were just like, okay, there, there's something special and there, there's legs here. So I think, I think the key thing here is um, the journey from going from a, um, a, you know, incorporating your business to where we are today has really taken um, every single skill set that we currently came with, um, as well as um, a, you know a really positive candy attitude more than anything. Um, we have had so many different obstacles come our way, and we've always had to pivot. We've always had to um, be strategic and think outside the box. Um, and I think that you know, coming from our big corporate backgrounds, we were given a a great set of skills that really helped you know us build our business. But it really was our commitment to um, our mission and our purpose. And, you know, why do we want to do this? And what can Tiny Sprouts offer um, 
you know, not only us as, as entrepreneurs, but our customers, which is what we're basing our entire product on and our customers being moms and their children, because we as moms understand the importance of, you know, the stresses that meal times brings, um, you know, for, for all other moms um, and the importance that their children's health has to them. And uh, we've been able to, from everything from designing our packaging to even sourcing our ingredients, um, you know, the different testing we do in every single decision we have made, we have put that customer um, in the center of that de- decision to be able to build our business to where it is today. You know, we come from backgrounds where we had teams, like teams and resources, endless amounts of those um, to help us get things from conception, ideation, all the way to commercialization. Um, so a huge learning for us was just that we don't we don't have that anymore. Uh, it was it's the team you see in front of you is the team. So we have done everything um, from designing our own p- packaging to working with suppliers and, and manufacturers who are massive compared to a, t- a teeny tiny startup. So it's been a massive learning. Um, as we we've, we've dove into those smaller, finer, finer day to day details, but it's been rewarding nonetheless. Yeah, that's amazing. And how did you start to get the word out? You have you have a great social media presence, and I'm curious how you kind of started to build that interaction with everyone and get the word out that you had started this. We started very organically, like we, you know, we once we decided, yeah, this is this is it. We're going to do this. Um, we knew we wanted to build a community before our products actually launched, right? So we just hit the road running, launched, you know, launched a social, our social media pages. Instagram is, is definitely our main focus. So I want to say maybe February of, it was um, exactly February. <laughs> yeah. February, 2021. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we had a moving launch date in our heads, but it was very much moving. There was nothing set in stone. Um, we launched a community in February and just started sharing information right? Like moms are hungry for information when it comes to their babies, when it comes to their young children, when it comes to their nutrition. So we started sharing a ton of information about health in general, but with a very heavy focus on seeds. Um, and people loved it, right? Like um, it was it was something that they were looking for. Um, we started building relationships with a lot of pediatric dietitians, a lot of who had massive followings on social. Um, and again, moms turn to these credible folks um, with the with the credentials and so on what, to get their information. So we turned to a lot of them. Um, we've really, really leaned into um, affiliate marketing, which is working well for us. But yeah, we started everything very organically and it's just grown throughout the, the past several months now, I guess over a year now um, to where we are today. And, and as most founders, we just don't, we don't have the money to like, you know, put into like big advertising and, you know, so organic growth is really, you know, something that is key to our heart. And as Tina mentioned, affiliate marketing, um, you know, and as we grow, it'll always be a big part of our business, but we would be looking to investigate other means as well. Yeah. Interesting. And I think I think you were also selected to be a uh, to do the pitch slam at Expo East in 2021. Can you talk a little bit about like applying for that and getting to do that event? For sure. So that was uh, that was like probably one of our first big things that had happened, which was, you know, um, being selected to yeah. uh, as a top 10 finalist for Pitch Slam was amazing because we weren't even we didn't even launch yet. <laughs> so, so we were the only pre-revenue launch, um, pre-revenue brand I think they've ever that's ever pitched. But it was an amazing experience to be selected. And I think it being um, being selected for uh, Pitch Slam really gave us kind of that cherry on top of, you know, our growing Sunday, um, that this is an idea that is going to fly. This is an idea that is turning heads. Um, this is something that is going to make a difference in the retail space and e-commerce space today. And, um, you know, it was, we, um, you know, coming from our, our highly corporate backgrounds, put so much time and effort into that application from defining our target customer to defining our, you know, one, three, five year plans. Um, you know, we, we literally crossed, uh, you know, all the T's and dotted all the I's and made sure that they had every bit of information they need. And that's what the judges came back with. They were like, wow, you guys know your business. And that was just getting that feedback from the judges before even pitch slam happened was so close to our heart because, um, once again, it reinforces that we are moving the right direction and we're doing what's right by, um, you know, our business and, and our end customer. Um, and then, yeah, getting up on stage and being able to present um, something that we have worked so hard on and, you know, gave up our corporate cre- careers for, which was a very scary step for us, as you can imagine. 
um, was an exhilarating experience. So I will forever be grateful to you hope for that opportunity. That's awesome. And I noticed that your like your super seed boosters are trademarked. And is that something that was like you decided to pursue right away? Is that something that was like difficult to figure out? I'm curious a, a little bit about that. Uh, so I'll talk about this one again. Um, so yeah, the second we came up with our name, we're like, this has to be trademarked. <laughs> um, and, a, and a lot of people told us that as well. Like it's just, a, it was, a, it was a piece of advice that, that, you know, a, a lot of people were just like, do it, do it right away. Don't worry. You'll regret it if you don't. Um, and yeah, like we, we took that advice. <laughs> like, okay, we have to do this. We took that advice, but unfortunately we got a little bit screwed because uh, we, you know, we did it through a company that eventually was caught for fraud and, you know, like how every entrepreneur, like, you know, gets, uh, gets kicked, um, kicked up somewhere. Um, we were picked up there, lost a lot of money, and then we had to reapply for a trademark and we never got that money back despite the fact that it was fraudulent, which was, you know, a couple of thousand dollars out of our pocket. Uh, a mm-hmm. couple of times. So um, at least now we're working with a, a really great lawyer and, um, you know, hopefully that that TM will turn to an R very soon. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That sounds so stressful. And those extra thousands of dollars are so, there's so many things you can do with yeah. that, that money to, and you're trying to use someone that should be a trusted source. Oh, that yes. sounds so stressful. It really sucks. It did suck. Now talking about it again. Oh, <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> Yeah, but it is it's such a good super seed boosters. I mean, that it, it's just it's awesome. So I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Can you talk a little bit too about your affiliate program? It sounds like you've done a lot there. Like I would love to just hear a little bit more about it. Uh, yeah, sure. It's um, it's we we like to call our affiliates basically they're our sales team, right? Like we're not in retail yet, um, so they are our our main. Um, there are, they're the word of mouth, they're, they're the words on the street, right? So we have tapped into many. We started very much heavily focused on the pediatric dietitians. So they really focus on, you know, providing the credible voice when it comes to feeding your baby, feeding your child. So we like to, you know, we'll, we, we're very heavily focused on just building the relationship. You know, it, it really does go a long way. And, and I think it's something that um, we've learned a lot more about over the, the past couple of years is that, you know, building that relationship is, um, is so helpful. Um, so we like to build that relationship with our key influencers and affiliates. We always send them our products. And the beauty of our products is that they, they truly love them. Um, they use them on their own children, right? So once they use them on their own children, um, they, they trust us, you know, they know us now personally, and then they feel no two ways about sharing it with their, with their followers. And something that we've heard, um, time and time again, which we love to hear, like not every product is suitable for affiliate marketing and ours is, and you know, our, our affiliates have come back to us on, on several occasions and have told us that our products, you know, they perform well above average compared to other products that they endorse. And, and the, really the beauty of it is because we are unique, you know, we are, we're the first of its kind, like a lot of the moms who eventually end up purchasing our boosters have never even thought twice about seeds for their children. They've never, either they, they hadn't heard of them or they've just never thought to use them on their babies because they think of them more as like adult superfoods. So they're, they're not safe for babies. So we're breaking down those myths um, and we're providing them with fact-based information and, and it's working. So we're, we're super happy about that. Like it's, it's now, I don't know the exact number, but we have an army <laughs> and it's growing and some are definitely better than others. Um, but you know, the more eyes that we can get on our boosters, the better. That's awesome. And when did you find, when and how did you find Startup CPG? Yeah, um, I, I'm trying to remember, and I'm pretty sure we found you guys through New Hope Network. Um, you know, our history would suggest that, you know, we pitch slam and all that great stuff. And they have a plethora of resources and they have their social channels. Found you through there. Um, I'm part of the Slack community. So Slack was actually a new thing for Kim and I. And then um, I remember specifically because um, I'm the one who enrolled on Slack. So went onto your website and saw that you guys had a community. And at that time, it was 8,000 and growing. I think you guys are well above 10K now. But uh, I was like, oh, okay, I, I want to join. <laughs> right? Um, so joined through there. Yeah, so New Hope joined the Slack community um, and have just been like, you know, overwhelmed and like extremely grateful for all the resources that are put out there by you guys. Um, it's so helpful and it's just, um, it's amazing. And, and one of the things that um, stands out the most when I think about the shelfies compared to the nexties and, and the pitch slam is that you guys make it easy 
right? Like it's just like so approachable uh, for startups like us, where, as you know, the funds are limited and sure we completed that one form that was pages and pages, but um, you know, it was so easy for the shelfies and, you know, just some key points, some pertinent information, but not pages and pages, not, hundreds of dollars or anything like that. And that, that for a brand like us, that is so awesome. Like it's, yeah. it, it's amazing. I love hearing that. That's so cool. I love that you found the community and are in the Slack channel and everything. And then that's really was the goal with the shelfies of, cause like I've been on the brand side of like, you're going to apply for award. I've like stayed up past midnight writing all the yes. essays. Cause the pages just keep coming. You're like, how, how many, how many essays do I have to write? Yeah. And then yeah. you get to the end and it's like, do you want to pay $600? And you're like, well, I did just write, I spent six hours writing an essay. Do it. I like, you know, it just, oh, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's so much. So yeah, the goal was low barrier to, to entry to really support the awesome emerging brands in our community. So I really love hearing that. No, thank you for that. Like I actually have a, a story about that where I did, did a whole application and then it said you had to be present at their conference in the event that you won. And I was like, oh, I can't. like, it was just, it was frustrating nonetheless. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, speaking of stories, are there any other stories that kind of stand out to you as either, you know, big wins that were validating or it could be something that, you know, didn't go well, but kind of uh, you know, are there any stories that you think back on already, even though, you know, you're you're still pretty early on? I'm just kind of curious if there's anything that stands out to you. Like, uh, you know, we've had like, we've had our challenges and we've had our obstacles, but we've also had our wins. So I, I, I you know, I love to celebrate wins because I think every entrepreneur um, has, has faced the obstacles we face, has gone through the challenges with their suppliers or co-packers or sourcing or pricing or losing money and, you know, getting screwed left, right and center. Like that's what just happens to you as a founder because you're, you know, you're pretty naive as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and you learn around, around the way. So like, if, if we just like, you know, talking about celebrating more wins, like, you know, we talked about you guys, our highlight, honestly, our highlight of the year uh, was a Shelfie award. Um, and then, you know, uh, being a finalist in for best pantry food for the next fee, another huge highlight, like pitch slam, another highlight. And then we've also even um, won the Amber Grant. So um, the Amber Grant is, um, it's an amazing grant for women founded businesses. Um, and we applied for the Amber Grant. And similar to the Shelfies, it was a really easy application. It was, you know, just tell us a little bit about your business. Tell us a little bit about you guys, about your product and boom. And, you know, we applied for it back in November. We didn't hear anything, but then... Um, in uh, in February of um, you know a couple months later, we got a call uh, from somebody from the Amber Grant saying that they had wanted to just you know talk about our business a little bit more, and we got on the phone with them, and then they told us that we had won <laughs> in a really cute and fun way, and it was it felt great. It was another win, and you know I think um, things to celebrate are things like um, these types of grants, or things like you know the CPG startup community um, because. They help funnel entrepreneurs like ourselves who have taken a risk, um, you know, have something special to share, um, and they really keep you motivated and keep you going because there are some days where, you know, you do feel like you're going to give up and you're going to crack. So um, I think that is something that is really important to always celebrate the wins um, when they come your way. Yeah, absolutely. And what what's coming up in 2023 that we should keep an eye, eye out for that's like top of mind for you? Um, yeah, curious about kind of what what the future holds. I'm going to say hopefully retail. <laughs> um, you know, we like Expo East was amazing for us. It opened a lot of doors. We, we managed to get in without having a booth and uh, it was so worth it. Got to talk to some great people. So we're really hoping that everyone will be able to, to get our boosters in retail very soon. Um, I know they say retail is a slippery slope, you know, um, all that great stuff, but we are a grocery store item. We belong on the grocery shelves so that, you know, we're in front of more moms. Um, the we need the distribution in order to, you know, scale up this business. So that really is the next big step for, um, Times Roads. And one other thing uh, <laughs> that Tina and I were talking about earlier today, there might be another product in the mix. 
So <laughs> uh, we'll see if there's another SKU that comes out in 2023 or 2024. So stay tuned because it's going to be a big one. Awesome. That's so exciting. And yeah, retail is challenging, but that yeah. is why we are all on the same team, right? I like to say CPG is a team sport. So that's why we've got Startup sure. CPG and you can leverage your community and, um, you know, all, all work on it together because it's challenging, but we're all trying to make a better food system together and get awesome products like yours on those shelves and accessible to everyone. So I'm so excited to keep following along your journey. I encourage listeners to go to tinysproutsfoods.com. You can go on Instagram at tinysproutsfoods and follow along and, you know, and check out the product. There, The the team at Startup CPG, even though, you know, when they were doing the taste testing, they're like, I know these are for kids, but I'm eating them every day. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, anybody can. Yeah, yeah anybody can eat them. Us. So, yeah, I love that. Hope people um, get to try your products. And just so glad that you could join me today and share a little bit more. This has been awesome. Thanks, Jesse. We totally appreciate your time. It's been amazing to speak to you. Yes, thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you for listening in today. I'm so honored you joined me for this conversation. And I love hearing from you all with feedback, suggestions, or if you just want to say hi at podcast at startupcpg.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn. If you liked this episode, we'd love for you to share it with a friend or colleague, subscribe so you don't miss future episodes, and maybe even leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you aren't yet in our Slack community of founders and experts, we'd love to see you there. You can get the free invite at startupcpg.com and find all our other awesome resources there like webinars, databases, the blog, the magazine, and virtual and in-person events. And if you found yourself rocking out to our intro and outro music, which I do every single time, make sure to check out the Super Fantastics on Spotify. It's the band of our startup CPG founder, Daniel Scharf. I'm Jesse Freitag, your host and producer, and on behalf of the whole team at Startup CPG, thank you for being here and see you next week.